Hi everyone, welcome to High School Group. I uh, hope you guys are doing well. Hope you had a great Thanksgiving. So, our topic today is, does the Bible tell me how to live? Does the Bible tell me how to live? So, last time we were talking about the Bible, and one of the things that we learn about the Bible is that um, people have all kinds of different ideas of what the Bible is for. So for centuries, people have trusted the Bible to contain everything we need to know about, well, everything. That some people use it as a history book, a blueprint for building societies, a, the definitive guidebook to the human body, a book of songs and bedtime stories, the only acceptable instruction manual for daily living, and an open window to heaven itself. That it's all right there. Everything you need to know to live a good life, right? Probably, maybe, kind of. So our question today is, if the Bible has all of the answers, why do we still have so many questions? So uh, let's watch our video and see what she's talking about today. Alright, the situation is complicated, so I went ahead and made some infographics. What? They helped me keep a cool head. So here we have my friends Kimmy and Becky, and here we have Kimmy's boyfriend, Eric Erickson. Seriously, what were his parents thinking? Kimmy and Eric have been dating for four and a half months, so they're basically the most established couple anyone knows. Or are they? Two months ago, Eric became Becky's lab partner, and the two of them have been spending a lot of time together. Becky finds him funny, cute, and he takes meticulous notes in class, which is pretty much the top three things Becky looks for. So Becky starts feeling feelings for Eric. Feelings! So last night, they were both studying for the chemistry test together when Becky kissed Eric, and Becky isn't sure, but she's pretty sure that Eric kissed her back. That's as far as I got in making the infographic, but that's what's going on. So Becky has asked me for help, which is why I have this. That's right, I even got a solid, non-digital copy because I need answers from the Bible, fast. And the Bible is definitely what I need because as Pastor Nancy from the Nancy Conference said, As it says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 through 17, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. So the Bible even says that the Bible is what I need right now. But I think I'm gonna go back online. That's actually faster for me. Well, I'm seeing a lot of rules in the Old Testament, and when it comes to adultery, it says the punishment is being stoned to death. Okay, this is a bad situation, but this isn't a kill someone with stone situation. And does this count as adultery? I need something more specific. All right, so this guy, A.J. Jacobs, actually compiled a collection of all the rules, laws, commandments, and guidelines in the Bible, and it's over 700 rules long. Who can keep track of that many? But it's okay, that's what word find is for. Kissing someone's boyfriend. No match. Boyfriend kissing? No. Boyfriend? No. Eric Erickson? Long shot, but I thought it was worth a try. So if there isn't any specific rule about this, is there a general rule? Oh wait, I know this. Jesus two big rules. Yep, just like I remembered. Jesus says we're supposed to love God and love each other. So how do we use that for this problem? Is loving each other the answer or is not loving each other the rule that Becky broke? Or is kissing someone you love? Wait, does Becky love Eric? Not yet, but I'm getting close, maybe. But... You did what again? Ah! Ah! OK, 
Okay, I'll hurry. Don't kiss anyone else until you hear from me. They just keep making it worse. It's like they can't control themselves. I gotta hurry. Okay, letters of Paul. What does he say about what Becky and Eric did? Okay, apparently if two people can't control themselves around each other, Paul advises they get married. I think Becky might be in more favor of the stoning idea than having to get married her sophomore year. She says her feelings for Eric are messy, but she can't even settle on one kind of pizza topping. Why is the Bible having so much trouble giving me directions for this? Okay, it looks like Paul was writing a lot of letters to early Christian communities because their relationships were messy and complicated too. They needed his advice for just how to coexist with regular day-to-day -day problems. Maybe Paul should be my go-to guy for answers. Wait, a disclaimer? Some of Paul's writings are just his opinions? Yup, there it is, in his own words. I have no command of the Lord, but I give my opinion as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. So how am I supposed to know if these are God's rules or just Paul's opinions? After listening to Pastor Nancy talk about scripture, I thought this was supposed to be easy. But how am I supposed to know what God wants if it isn't neatly labeled with footnotes? <sighs> All right, if the Bible doesn't have the answer to my situation, what does that mean? Hmm, Pete Enns, modern biblical scholar and theologian says, the Bible is ambiguous. The Bible is really not all that clear about what we should actually do and think. When it comes to the detail of our lives, we need to work it out, which is a wisdom task. So it takes the Bible and wisdom? Do I even have wisdom? I don't want to give Becky some bad advice because I'm using the Bible wrong and then make things worse. Or maybe things will just get worse on their own. So she mentioned one guy in our video, um, an author. His name is A.J. Jacobs. Um, it's actually one of my favorite books. And so if you ever are interested in a book, it's not a boring textbook. It's not a theology book. It's he, He's uh, sort of a humor writer. So uh, it's serious stuff. He doesn't just like make fun of things. But he does this conversation about the Bible and rules in a humorous way. Um, and he makes this list of the 700 rules or seven, more than 700 rules in the Bible and he tried to follow them, but he found it impossible. Uh, my favorite, one of my favorite ones is um, he grows his hair out long and he wears robes and stuff. And then he's out walking and he sees two people that he thinks are being um, were cheating maybe and it says that you need to stone him so he carries little pebbles in his pocket and he starts throwing pebbles at people um, there's another one where he lo gets locked in a bathroom uh, the his the doorknob in their their bathroom at home um, breaks and the knobs fall off well the knob fell off and he closed the door behind him and he couldn't get his get out and he's stuck in the bathroom for like th three hours before his wife gets home from work and he gets so bored sitting in the bathroom that he finally decides to pray after he's counted the ceiling tiles like 19 times. So that's a couple other examples of fun stuff that are in this book. But the question is how do you figure out which rules in the Bible to follow? Uh, there's so many of them and we can't follow all of them that how do you? follow them all um, I sort of wonder like I think that's part of the problem is we think of it as a rule book or a, a life guidebook when it's not that it's it's a it's not an instruction manual or history book it is a source book about God it's not about how to live life it's how to live life with God with us so uh, let's look at our two, we had two Bible readings we're going to do today. 
Uh, let's look at our two Bible readings and then we'll talk a little bit more about what that means. So, Our first one is from Exodus 21. If people are fighting and hit a pregnant woman and she gives birth prematurely, but there is no serious injury, the offender must be fined whatever the woman's husband demands and the court allows. But if there is serious injury, you are to take life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, bruise for bruise. That seems rather harsh, doesn't it? Um, uh, it, it but this, this line, this text is actually used or put like this in the Old Testament not to be overly strong with punishment, but to actually make sure that punishment is equal. That if you hurt in that society, if, if you would hurt someone, you should punish the other person more than what they did. So if he just slaps the pregnant woman, you should just kill him. That's too much. It should be the same. So that's why we have this uh, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. It should be an equal footing or an equal status that what the first person got, the other person gets the same, not more. So it's not a make sure you do up to it. It's a make sure you don't do more than that. If they uh, knock out a tooth, don't take their eye out. Don't kill them because they just knocked out a tooth. So, But then Jesus comments on this text. So let's read Jesus's. Jesus says, You have heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So that's our text and it's a little different. Jesus seems to say, don't retaliate. Um, there's a quote from uh, uh, Indian uh, man who worked for independence for India. You might have heard Gandhi. I don't know if you've heard his name, uh, Mahatma Gandhi. And he said, connected to this line, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, he said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for the tooth for tooth leaves the whole world blind. If we interpret this as they took my eye, so I'm going to take their eye, and they get, go, well, they took my eye, so I'm going to take their eye. If we keep on doing this cycle of retaliation, it can get me too much. That if it isn't just one for one, but then it's one for one for one for one for one, uh, it gets snowballing, like a snowball going down a hill, making bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, it can be out of control. And so Jesus is saying, don't go out of control with this. Um, so do things like turning the other cheek. Be the one who stops the violence. Um, if they want to take your shirt, well, give them your coat. Don't just don't don't go against people. Don't fight against them. Go too mild with someone. Uh, be the one who loves a neighbor as well as loving enemy or love enemy as well as loving neighbor and praying for those who are against us so um, both of these instructions are about managing conflict in the both of these instructions about managing conflict are in the bible which one should you follow and why um i'm a pastor uh and i'm gonna go with jesus <laughs> Um, I mean, there's nothing wrong. I think the idea, if you keep it at, if you do need punishment, to not make it overboard punishment is the message of the first one. But I think it too easily becomes just, well, I, I got to get them. The, I got to retaliate. They can't, they can't do that to me. And that's when it becomes bad is when it's just uh, cycles over and over. And so I think um, to make sure we go, well, you know what? 
I can be the one who puts a stop to this cycle of anger back and forth between people. What if instead of using physical punishment, we actually sit down and talk? What if we work to solve the initial problem instead of just getting angry and angrier and more mad and more mad at each other and actually solve what the problem may be? Um, so that's why I pick the first one. The there's a whole book in the Bible. Let me grab my. So again, if you have your Bible, you opened it up in the middle. I'm actually in Proverbs. You can you probably be in Psalms or Proverbs. Um, Psalms is first usually, but then Proverbs. So the whole book is called Proverbs, and it's in the section with Psalms that they're called wisdom literature. And it's one of the parts of the Bible, along with specific laws like the Ten Commandments and Levitical Codes. Those are that's what we read uh, before. Is part of that uh, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, or from the Ten Commandments: uh, Do not steal, do not kill, do not commit adultery, that sort of thing. And they're intended to help people live well. So they're giving some instructions and get along and be happy and that sort of things. But Proverbs is different than those. It's not stuff like um don't kill people uh, if they're if you're mad you can only do so much damage back to them it is insights so um i'm back i had to pause for a second there because i wanted to figure out and find one that i like so this is one that i like this is from proverbs 21 5 so proverbs 21 5 it says the plans of the diligent sh lead surely to abundance but everyone who is hasty comes only to want. So it's not, so the idea of it is um, the plans of the diligent, so people who make plans, who they think things through, lead surely to abundance. If you think things through and you think about the problems you're going to have along the way, the, the things that you need to work on to get to what you want in your goal, you'll have good come out of it most of the time that you'll lead to abundance that you may not have a lot of abundance but for the most part if you think through your goals and what you need to accomplish them you'll have a good chance at accomplishing them but everyone who is hasty comes only to want if you don't do that if you just rush through things and don't think about consequences don't think about the things that you need to do to get to places or you uh, to not think about the um, issues along the way you're going to come to want you're not going to do as good you maybe occasionally you'll figure out your problem and you'll do it but a lot of the time what's going to happen you're going to fail at it because you didn't think about what if this obstacle comes about or what if this things. And so the book of the Proverbs, they're about all this sharing of insights instead of just listing do's and don'ts. So it doesn't tell you how to do plans. It doesn't tell you how to be diligent, but it's telling you maybe you should be diligent and not hasty in things. And so I think that is a good way to think about what the Bible is, is it's not this instruction book telling us exactly how to do things. What the Bible is, is a way to talk about God, but it's a way for us not to make decisions for us. It is a tool to help us make decisions. Now we don't turn to the Bible to go, well, what should I do? If I go, uh, the word of the Lord came to me, does that, that doesn't tell me what to do, but I can gain insight in the Bible to help me think through the problems and things that are going on in my life. So, and you get other ways. It's, the Bible isn't the only place for that sort of thing, that the Bible helps us in that sort of things, but doing things like listening to teachers, listening to parents and grandparents who have experience in things like that, all of these are different things that we put into our tool that help us be diligent as the proverb there said they're all ways for us to go how do I get through this problem I have in my life right now so it's not just flipping through the book and finding the thing and then that will be my answer it's 
here's one tool to help me think about it. And along with all the other tools of my knowledge from school, my experience from my parents and grandparents and friends. So that is our lesson for today. Hope you guys have a great week. We have two more lessons uh, before we're done for Christmas break. Um, but then uh, in January, I'll figure out a date, but probably this, the week after school starts. We're going to start in person. Uh, we're going to start at 6.30, uh, and uh, I'll send you more information when we get there. But have a great week, everyone.